Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today uh, at the Member Summit. My name is Kip Boyle, and I've been working in cybersecurity for a long, long time, actually. Uh, I started way back in 1992 when I went on active duty in the United States Air Force. And over the years, I've had different roles. I've um, helped corporations, I've helped uh, government, and I've helped uh, regular people uh, with this problem of how do I stay secure when I'm using the internet? And I'm also a parent, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you are parents, or if you're not a parent, maybe you've got a favorite niece or a nephew, or just somebody younger who, um, who you care about. And so today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about how you can master cybersecurity in just 10 steps as a parent, as, as somebody who has a family that they, that they care about. So here we go. I'm ready for my uh, slides, please. Ah, wonderful. Thank you so much. And if I can just get my, uh, my control going here, stand by. Just want to make sure I know what I'm doing. Hey, there we go. Okay, good. So I'm all set. Uh, now, the, I'm going to share some lessons with you today, and these lessons are drawn from my experience, and they're also based on what I do with my family. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen uh, to us on, on the Internet and can happen to our kids on the Internet. And being hacked at home could mean just, you know, losing a little bit of money or maybe some data gets deleted and you've got to recreate a few files and that's going to cost uh, you know you some time and energy. And these days we're all so busy that even you know rewriting one file can seem very overwhelming, and uh, and it's not something we want to do, right? We never want to do the same thing twice. But it's really important to understand what's at risk. It could be anything from something small like that to spending hundreds of hours fixing your credit record, or maybe uh, having to deal with your health insurance because the, um, you know, somebody stole your identity and they used your medical insurance to file fraud fraudulent claims. And while you wouldn't necessarily be out of money directly for that, what happens is, is that if you have any kind of a cap on your, uh, on your insurance amounts, uh, those fraudulent claims could result in you not having as much insurance protection as you would expect in the event that something awful would happen. The, another thing that could happen too is that when you're in the process of buying or selling a house, you're moving thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And a lot of people unfortunately find themselves in a situation where that money uh, can be at risk. And, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a moment. Now, uh, the, the thing to realize is that even our kids uh, can find themselves getting into trouble um, if they have uh, unfiltered and unsupervised access to the internet. And this is something parents have to be super, super careful about um, because without those kinds of filters on the internet, kids are exposed to all kinds of things and they themselves can be uh, emotionally manipulated and, uh, and I know no parent uh, wants that to, to happen to their kids. Now, I also want you to focus more on uh, beyond just technology. Now, the thing is, is that um, technology is kind of how we've gotten into the situation where we have to be concerned about online fraud and you know, the different things, bad things that can happen to us. But what I've found in my work over the years is that it's more, uh, the solution is gonna be more than just throwing more technology on it. You know, uh, when I first started doing cybersecurity, uh, what most people would do to deal with this problem is they would buy Norton antivirus or they'd buy the package from McAfee or, you know, whoever. There were lots of choices. And they would just buy an antivirus uh, package, pay the subscription fee, put it on their computer. And it was a wonderful easy button because once you did that, you, you pretty much were okay. And, and you didn't have to really worry about getting uh, exploited. But unfortunately, in this day and age, and for the foreseeable future, there really is not that kind of an easy button anymore. The sophistication of the attacks and, um, and the number of people that are attacking us and the opportunities uh, to attack us has just gone up and up and up. 
Mm -hmm. in 2025, so just a couple of years from now, we're expecting the global cost of cyber crime and cyber failures of all kinds to roll up to $10 trillion, which is an amazing amount of money. And, and if you measured that amount of money against the size of national economies, it would be the third largest national economy in the world behind the United States and China. So we're talking about a really big problem here. And it's not just, uh, if you ever saw the movie War Games or if you ever seen the television show, Mr. Robot, you know, it's not just a bunch of, uh, of you know, socially misfit uh, people, you know, kids, teenagers doing this. This is a real business for people living in other countries, especially, and, um, and, they're, and they're coming after our money and committing these uh, kinds of frauds in a very structured and methodical way. And so we need to use technology to defend ourselves, but we need to use more than that because the biggest way that people uh, get us when they attack us is they aren't manipulating our systems. What they're really doing is manipulating our emotions. And if you've ever heard of a little phrase called social engineering, well, that's what that means is that somebody is trying to manipulate us. It's a, it's a con, right? And people have been conned for thousands of years. So the the you know the the attack isn't new what's new is that it's happening uh through technology and that it's scaling in a way that it's never scaled before so whether it's uh, a phishing email or a text message or a phone call uh that's fraudulent it could even be a work from home scam there's actually documented uh evidence that the cyber criminals are even trying to uh position uh, supporting them as a form of work from home. And when this happens, and if you fall into this trap, then they'll turn you into a, a, what they call a money mule, which is a, which is a way of getting you to kind of launder their money for them. So I want you to be severely suspicious whenever anybody asks you to do something with money online. It's really important that you just, you be very, very suspicious about that. And I want to tell you uh, a story and it's an awful story because, um, you know, this is happening to people more and more. And, and I don't want this to happen to you. But, uh, you know, money transfer fraud in personal real estate transactions is becoming a real problem. It's uh, estimated that people have lost at least $12 billion over the past five years. And this type of fraud, this mortgage wire fraud scam, is uh, is just happening more and more. And the way it works is that the attacker poses as your real estate agent over email, or perhaps uh, they show up in your email box as a representative from your escrow company. And what they do is they give you a very convincing email that explains how you need to change where you're going to wire your closing costs to. Um, and And if you follow their instructions, and you know a lot of people do because buying a house or selling a house is a very stressful time. We are absolutely saturated with tasks and things to do. And it's very difficult to take a moment and ask, ask yourself, you know, is this a legitimate email? And, um, and that's how a lot of these uh, mortgage wire frauds are happening these days. It's, it's a very insidious thing. And unfortunately, some families have lost their entire house down payment or they've lost the proceeds of their sale so please, 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 I want you to verify any wire instructions that you receive by email or on a website. I want you to, to call, <laughs> actually pick up the phone, and I want you to call somebody who you trust from, the, from wherever those instructions came from, whether it was your realtor or whether it was from the escrow company. And I don't want you to use the, the uh, phone number in the email that you receive because if it's a fraudulent email, it will be a fraudulent phone number as well. And they'll answer the phone and they'll talk to you in a very convincing way that, that those wire instructions are authentic and accurate, even, even if they're not. So I want you to go to a trusted directory to find a phone number that you trust. And I want you to call and I want you to verify those wire instructions. Just take that extra little bit of time to protect yourself. Now, here's one family's uh, awful story. And unfortunately, you can go to the internet. You can find many, many more. Um, but just a, just a, just three years ago, um, there was a psychology professor at UC Berkeley, and you can see a 
photograph of his, of his uh, beautiful family right here. And he wired almost a million dollars uh, to a, a bank account because he was going to buy a new home for his family. But he was defrauded and the money ended up going to a bank account that wasn't correct. And all the money disappeared and practically left them homeless because they sold one house. They were trying to close on the next one and they, they had closed the sale, but they hadn't consummated the purchase and they were stuck in a really bad situation. And I don't want that uh, for you. So, uh, so again, there's, there's a lot of things at risk here and it's, it's, it's difficult to know when you're going to be uh, vulnerable. So the takeaway is that cybersecurity isn't just a few quick fixes on your computer. Rather, it's the way you do things every day and you can get some tools and I'm gonna talk about some tools that I think will help you, but we're also talking about changing some habits or getting some new habits, like the habit I told you just a moment ago about how you need to verify those wire instructions that you receive over an email every time, all the time, and the need to become suspicious when somebody asks you to do something with money when that request comes uh, to you over a, uh, some, some form of internet communication, all right? Now, I also want you to see this change as an opportunity to build trust with your kids. Um, and if, you've, if you already have a lot of trust with your kids, that's fantastic. I want you to build on that. Now, the reason why I want you to use this as, this, as an opportunity for your kids is because we have to teach our kids what to do. The kids today, uh, typically considered to be Generation Z or Gen Z, um, as they grow up, we as parents and as older people who, who love them and want the best for them, have to pass on some good habits to them. And you know what? It's, it's, we don't want them to be victims of scams of any kind. And so we need to, we need to teach them what to do. And just like we teach our kids how to wash their hands, right? And why do we do that? Because we don't want them to get sick and they're touching stuff all the time that has germs on it. So of course we want them to, you know, keep clean hands. Well, it turns out that on the internet, there's digital cooties out there as well. And so we want to teach them what to do to keep those digital germs from making their computers sick and making their bank accounts sick and that sort of thing. So I find that this idea of disease and washing your hands is a really good analogy for cybersecurity. And it lets you teach them in, 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 in age appropriate ways to, and it allows you to you know, uh, set and enforce healthy boundaries, like limiting their, the amount of time they spend on the internet, being careful that they uh, are only accessing age appropriate content, age appropriate apps, that sort of thing. And you know, you'd never let them chew on lead paint chips and you'd never let them uh, walk around in the more dangerous parts of town. And really there's a digital equivalent of, of all that stuff uh, going on. So let's talk about some tools because I know people really, uh, really you know, enjoy uh, getting a tool to help make things easier. So now kids are naturally gonna do what you do. And what I'm showing here, this is step number six, is, is how you can be an example. Now on the left side of this, uh, research result that Google actually did. Um, they asked security non-experts, um, what are the top five things that you can do to stay safe online? And then they asked on the right-hand side, they asked a bunch of security experts, what, what can you do to stay safe online? And then this gives us an opportunity to kind of compare the list. And you'll notice that the number one thing that non-experts said was, well, I should use an antivirus package. And again, that's kind of old... Uh, thinking. If you look at the number one item on the experts list, it's install software updates. And I know how pesky it can be to get that little pop-up box that says, you know, either, hey, you should install uh, software updates or uh, sometimes even worse, hey, I'm, I'm installing software updates right now. You need to wait, right? And we don't want to wait. I get that. But notice the difference here, right? Old thinking versus new thinking. And that's because cyber is a dynamic risk. It's changing all the time. And unfortunately, we need to keep, keep up with that. Otherwise, it, it opens us up for the kinds of fraud you know, that, I, that I talked about and, um, and frauds we haven't even uh, imagined yet. So as you read down this list, you can see uh, use strong passwords, but security experts say, uh, yeah, but use unique passwords. In other words, never reuse a password uh, in two different places. And that seems really hard. So a password manager would be a great tool 
to help you there. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, use two-factor authentication, use strong passwords is, is in fourth place versus second place, and use a password manager is the fifth one. So if you're not doing these five things that are on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you need to up your game. And let me help you do that by talking about how you do these things. Um, one of the things that I do recommend is that you use, if you're a Windows user, there's an antivirus uh, software built in. It's called Microsoft Defender. And it's actually a very good product. So um, if you don't have an antivirus package, uh, anti-malware package, it's actually still useful. It's just not, it's not enough on its own. So I would, I would recommend uh, that, that you do that. Now, the good news is these days, when if you're using Windows 10 or Windows 11, your software updates are going to happen automatically. And, and so please do that. Find a way to live with it because this is a really effective way to keep people from getting into your uh, computer with malicious code. And, um, and it's automatic, right? So you just have to kind of go along for the ride. So I really recommend that. Now, in terms of a, of a password manager, this is one that I use and that I have vetted for myself. And I'm a small business owner. And I have a team of people that work for me. And we uh, provide cybersecurity services to our customers. And so we want to walk our talk as well. So we went out to find what was the best password manager that we could use. One that not only was you know doing the things that we needed to do, make long, complex passwords that are unique for every site, but something that could make us uh, productive um, and also be attack resistant, right? Because we don't want our passwords to get compromised because they get attacked. And so this is the winner uh, for now. We were on another password manager before, which we left because it ended up being attacked and we didn't like uh, the way that the company responded. So right now I would recommend 1Password. And I wanna be clear, I get no reward for mentioning this product, okay? If you go buy 1Password, it's not gonna make any difference to me. I have no financial incentive to share this with you. I'm just telling you that, that this is the one we use and we spent a lot of time examining the choices. And um, so I just wanna pass that on uh, to you in case it's helpful. Now, one of the great things about a password manager is it's actually going to create passwords for you. You're not going to have to be in the business of trying to figure out how to make one of those crazy long passwords. In fact, you don't even have to remember the passwords that you get created because they're going to be stored in a, in, a, in a digital vault. And when you need to use them, you can just press a couple of buttons and one password will put those into the user ID and the password fields for you. So it's a really wonderful thing. And here I've got just a screen grab of the different options that are available when you're creating passwords. You can control uh, how long they are, um, you know, what they look like, and that sort of business. So this is a really great uh, productivity item for you. Now, we talked about two-factor authentication as being something that you uh, should do. Remember, it's on the right side of that research report. And, um, and there's different ways to do it, right? You can, you can get a text code. Uh, sent to your mobile phone and you know if you if you if you use BECU you know that's you're going to have that as an option i want to tell you that getting text codes isn't the isn't the most secure way to do it it's certainly better than not doing one uh, two factor authentication but what i've got on the screen here is i've got the app icons for google authenticator and microsoft authenticator so these are smartphone apps that you can use that will generate these little um, uh, one-time passwords, right? These little six-digit codes. It'll generate them for you on your device so that you don't have to pass them over the text messaging network, which actually isn't secure at all. Uh, anybody can snoop on that network. And so uh, it's, it's just uh, something to be careful about in the future, especially as, as the attackers figure out um, how to grab these codes from us. I've already seen them starting to do it. So I, want, I just want you to be warned um, now, if you ever set up uh, security questions, right? If anybody says, hey, you know, let's, let's get some security questions going. I want you to give answers that have nothing to do with the question, okay? So you can see here, um, I took a little screen grab when I was asked one time to, to make some questions up. And so the question that I picked was, in which city was my father born? And I just made up an answer, Vega 98133. Nobody cares what the answer is. The only thing that matters is when you get asked the question, that you give the answer that you originally gave. Now, you might be saying, well, that's 
you know, all fine and good, Kit, but how am I going to remember that that's the question, that that's the answer I gave? Well, you're going to put this in your password manager. That's how you're going to remember. So that way, if you need to look it up, it's, it's going to be right in there. You'll be able to pull it up really quickly and it'll be secure because it's going to be in this digital vault that you're going to keep for yourself. Um, the only thing I can tell you about these answers, they can be anything you want. Just make sure they're easy for you to say out loud because if you ever have to call and verify your identity, they might ask you one of these uh, questions. So just make it something that you can pronounce uh, and, and, you'll, and you'll be good to go. Now, if you ever uh, find yourself with lost data, because that's something that can happen these days, um, the way to deal with that is you want to make a backup of your data. And if you use a Mac, I do, then there's a built-in utility called Time Machine. And all you have to do is flick a couple of, uh, of, of buttons and, and it'll just happen for you automatically, which is great. And of course, if you're using uh, a Windows computer, it has a utility, and this is not the best screenshot in the world, but you know what, you're gonna, you're gonna all get copies of my slides, so it's not a problem. Uh, you'll be able to look at this for yourself. But in Windows, it's called File History, and you can turn it on with Windows 10 and Windows 11, and you can do file history right on your hard drive, or you can buy an external hard drive and you can store the backups of your files. They are highly recommend uh, that you do that. Now, if you're gonna do backup of data to the cloud, cloud is fantastic in terms of it's convenient, it's, it's inexpensive. I would just suggest that you need to control the encryption. And, and so if you wanna take this extra step and you wanna encrypt your data before you put it on the cloud, um, this is a, a utility, it's called Spider Oak One. And again, I'm not mentioning this because I get any financial reward if somebody buys into this. You know, if you get if you become a subscriber, I have no idea. Um, I just know that this is something we've looked at and it works. And I just want to share that knowledge with you. Whether you choose this or something else, I just want you to be aware that when your data is in the cloud and it's not encrypted, it's more vulnerable than than if it is uh, encrypted. It's going to be a lot better. Now, one of the biggest problems today is ransomware. I don't know if you've heard of ransomware. Maybe you've heard that at work. Uh, it used to be that, that ransomware was something that, in the beginning, uh, happened to individuals. And, and people's individual computers were, were being encrypted, and they were losing access to, uh, to all of their family photos. And it was really awful. Um, so this is something that can be a real issue. Now, there's, um, there's some ransomware protection available if you use Windows. And when you get the notes for um, my presentation today, there's going to be a URL on this slide that's going to, uh, you click on that and it's going to uh, give you the steps that you can use to turn on that ransomware protection. So I want you to look at that as well. Now, another thing you can do is don't use an admin account on your computer when you're browsing the internet, doing email, writing a document, because most malware assumes when it gets to your computer that you are the admin. If you're not the admin, if you're just using an ordinary user account, then a lot of malware doesn't even work or it takes a lot more effort for it to work and that's in your favor. So if you don't know whether you're the administrator or not, go find your neighborhood friendly nerd and get them to help you. The only caveat to that advice that I just gave you is don't ask your kids to be your IT support because then if you do some of the things I'm gonna recommend in a moment, they can actually undo them. So, you know, uh, be careful about that. Okay, now when it comes to kids, one thing that I, that I wanna encourage is that you make it difficult for them to use the internet in secret because uh, secrecy and technology together is a breeding ground for people to, to become manipulated by others. And I know you don't want that for your kiddos. I don't want that for my kiddos. Did I tell you that I'm married and I've got six kids? So listen, <laughs> I've been down this road and I understand what's, what's going on with these devices. And uh, so I want you to be safe. So when you're doing, uh, when the kids are doing internet, I want you to set them up to do it in a highly visible space. And, um, and, uh, and when they go to bed at night, don't let them have their devices uh, alone in their rooms. That's not a recipe for success. Um, watch out for voice activated toys because many of them actually also listen to you uh, surreptitiously. Uh, so you know, just, just put an extra put an extra thought, right? You, I want you to get a new habit where you're gonna where you're gonna think about this stuff um, as you're adding devices uh, to to your home. 
Now, if you want to do some content filtering, and I really, I really recommend it, there's a free content filtering service that will cover your whole house. Anybody using Wi-Fi or plugging into your network uh, will, will have to put up with this. And it's, it's called OpenDNS.com. It's a free service for families. I highly recommend it. It's, um, it's, it's very easy to use and it doesn't slow you down. So if that's something you're concerned about, uh, I, I really recommend that. Microsoft has its own family safety product that you should probably look at. And it lets you uh, actually control different factors about their device so that you can uh, help them develop the healthy habits that you want them to have. Um, and also you can do a little, a little content filtering as well, which I think is, is very helpful. Now, are they going to be unhappy because you've, you filter their content? Of course they are, but they're unhappy about all kinds of things like brushing their teeth. If you can get them to brush their teeth and, and, you know, and, and deal with it, you can make this happen as well. Now, if you're using a Mac, there's a similar, uh, capability. It's called screen time and inside of screen time is another piece of functionality. It's called downtime, and you can control all kinds of aspects on their devices, when they can use them, which apps they can use. You can turn on and turn off the app store, which I think is a, a great thing uh, to be able to control. It's going to take a little extra work from you, but I think that's okay because you know, you're know you going to help them get those great digital habits, and that's going to help you, right? Because if you can model those habits, it's going to help you stay out of trouble and so that your bank account isn't going to get ripped off. OK, so again, you want to you want to be thoughtful about boundaries. You want to set those boundaries, not just for your kids, but for yourself. And the final step is if you don't know how to use all this social media stuff that's, that, that the kids are using today, ask them to teach you. You know, they might look at you weird at first, but if you just keep at it and 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 let them teach you and have a little bit of fun with it, it's going to really help you with um with setting these boundaries that I'm talking about, okay? And having honest conversations about why you're setting these boundaries and, 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 and when those boundaries will be uh, broadened, right? So as they get older and as they can show more responsibility with online uh, time, then you can give them more permissions. It's just like I would never let my second grader get on her bike and ride a mile away from my house with, you know, without any supervision. But as she shows over time that she can be trusted, then I let her ride her bike further and further, right? So my final thought about this before we go into Q&A is you teach your kids the difference between healthy and unhealthy relationships. I'm sure you do when they're at school and, and they're having trouble with their, their uh, classmates or maybe they're having a run in with the teacher or whatnot. Well, there are healthy and unhealthy relationships that they're, that that you need to teach them about when they're uh, when they're online as well. So, having said that, those are the ten steps that I wanted to share with you, and I would be happy to uh, take your questions. I did see that that there are some questions that came in. So, Bradley, can you help? Yep. Hello. Yeah, we have a couple of questions for you. The first question we have is. Uh, you showed quite a few configuration screens. What can we do if we're not very technical? Right, and, and you know, that's a common issue, and, uh, and I understand that. So what I tell people is that somewhere in your neighborhood or in your circle of friends, there's going to be mm -hmm. a very friendly nerd, somebody who would love to help you if you would you know, just ask them, you know, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Uh, but the caveat is, I'm sure you probably have kiddos in your family or in your extended family who could probably do it too. But you know, you don't want the fox to guard the hen house, to you know, to put it that way. So when you find a nerd, make sure they're going to be on your side when all of this <laughs> stuff goes down. All right. And that's my answer. Looks like we have another question. Is how can I know if a website is secure before entering personal or financial information on it? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, there are different things that you can look for. Some of them are very technical, and I'm, I'm not going to dive in, into those. But um, you can. one of the most important things to look for is that you see HTTPS. All right. So you want to look for that S. In some web browsers, you'll see like a green padlock. It depends on the browser you use. 
but there usually be some kind of a visual indication that you've got an, an, encrypt, an encrypted connection. So that's important to look for. You also wanna make sure that you're on the right website because these days criminals are standing up websites that when you glance at the URL, it looks correct, but it's actually not. They kind of mess with the characters a little bit. And so you wanna be careful about, about that as well. Um, and you know, I think the best way to make sure that I'm going to the right uh, uh, website is to, first of all, maybe type it in myself so that, I, so that I know it's the correct URL and then bookmark it and then use that bookmark all the time. There's gonna be a, a, a temptation to click on a link in an email that you get, right? Because uh, maybe your financial institution send you an email, but I wouldn't do that. I would open my browser, access my bookmark, and then I would use a trusted uh, bookmark all the time. And that's a good practice. Habits, it's all about habits, people. <laughs> Perfect. So another question came in is how often should I change my online banking password? The uh, now there is different schools of thought on this. And the reason for it is because over time, the attackers get, get more and more uh, sophisticated. And so there's a lot of old password password advice out there that would say something like, you need, you need to change your password every 90 days or something like that, or every 30 days. Maybe at work, maybe your employer has a rule like that. But there's some new research out that suggests that if you can create a password that is in the, say, 16 to 20 character range, and you would do that by creating a passphrase, by the way. But if you can get something long like that, you never have to change it. Wouldn't that be nice? to get out of the password changing <laughs> business. So now the way you make a passphrase is you just put like three or four words together, but don't make it like a popular, like don't make it the title of a song that everybody's singing, right? That's a little too obvious, but uh, just put three or four words together that means something to you and use that as your passphrase. And then you never have to change it. If you do end up at a place where they tell you, hey, you gotta change my password every 90 days. Well, that's where your password manager is gonna come to the rescue because it'll do all that hard work for you. Perfect. So, Other questions? Yeah, it looks like another one just came through that says, what if my kids really fight me on the boundaries that you are suggesting? They will fight you, especially if they <laughs> don't have boundaries right now. If you haven't put a lot of boundaries in place and they're used to having a free range on the internet, they will absolutely think you are the devil incarnate, okay? But let me ask you this. If you found them playing with a dangerous substance, like let's say they found a, a little thing of mercury and they were playing with it, would you let them keep playing with it simply because they were gonna give you a bunch of flack? No, absolutely not. Now, is the internet nothing but mercury? It's not, but I can tell you this, the number of clicks away from the kinds of outrageous content that you would never willingly let your child see is shockingly small, shockingly small. So, and you know probably what I'm talking about, and it's all kinds of stuff. It's, you know, I couldn't, I could give you the list, but I don't even want to go there. The point is, is that you know what's good for your kids. You need to dig in your heels and you need to put the boundaries in place and they will fight you and you got to stick to your guns and they'll get used to it. And if you need to, blank, just say, you know what? I saw a presentation. There was a guy named Kip and he said, that I should do this. So you guys, you can blame me. I can take it. <laughs> that is all the questions I have right now. All right. Uh, well, I'm so glad that you invited me to be here. Yeah, we're so thankful to have you. And I'm sure the members are super thankful to have you. The presentation was super informational and hopefully everyone can take something away from it. And by the way, I'm a member. I, I'm at BECU. My kids are at BECU. My business is at BECU. I love credit unions. Oh, that's so awesome to hear. We love our members. And that's why we do this right here is to help educate them, keep them protected any way that we can. And it's just a treat to help. So what do we do now, Bradley? Well, I don't see any more questions in here right now. So... If 
anyone has any questions, now is a great time. I know we do have a Q&A coming up shortly, but now is a great time if you have any questions pertaining to KIPS. Let's see if you can stump me. Come on, give me a really hard question. Yeah. Because I've got a button here that hides me in case it's really <laughs> awful. Oh, so you're just going to leave me here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, come on, everybody. No? Nothing in here yet. Should, should I tell you about ChatGPT for a moment? Yeah. OK. Let me talk to you about ChatGPT. Uh, it's a it's a, it's an amazing tool. I've been I've been working a lot with it, and there's just some really amazing things that you can do with it. Um, and my tip for you is that is that the best way to get something out of ChatGPT is to prompt it, to tell it to take on a persona, right? So um, let's say you had a question about cybersecurity. You could go to ChatGPT or any of these large language model type, you know, Bard, I think is Google's. Anyway, so go to one of these things and then in the box, right, type in there and say, I want you to take on the role or the persona of a cybersecurity expert. And I want you to answer my questions and I want you to do it in a helpful, friendly way with simple language. Hit return. And it'll say, sure, what do you want to know? And then you can start asking it all those questions you were afraid to ask me right now. <laughs> That's awesome. So we did get another question. Yay. Um, if you work from home, how would you protect your personal devices from your work devices? You know what? I work from home and I have for the last eight years because I own my own business. Mm -hmm. And so we have a full, fully remote workforce and it's working great for us. I know that's not the right answer for everybody. But for us, it works really, really well. Now, what I would recommend is that you uh, have two, two devices. If you can afford it, if that's possible, you should have two devices. So that way, you have this nice physical separation between your home and you know personal world and your work world. I got to tell you, as a chief information security officer, um, I have seen a lot of employees get into a lot of trouble because they allowed content that is completely appropriate for them to get onto work computers where it is not appropriate at all. So that's a good reason to have two completely separate devices because um, then, then it doesn't matter what you do on your device. You're not gonna risk your employment or some sort of a disciplinary action, which I wouldn't want for you. But if you have to have a, a device where you're, where you're mixing you know, personal with work, I would just be really careful about that. And, you know, a lot of employers are uh, creating the opportunity to create little containers on like a bring your own device situation where the company data is put into this little digital vault and it all lives in there. And, and so you get like a logical separation. So if you, you know, so talk to your IT department and ask, is that what's going on if you're in a BYOD situation? And then I think you can feel a little bit more comfortable that, that you've got that separation. Perfect. So it looks like we got just a couple minutes left, but we did get one more question here. So how does the new AI technologies affect cybersecurity in the future? Well, it's going to affect it quite a bit. It's I see it as a tool that's going to rapidly accelerate the cybersecurity world. And it's going to do it in two ways, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, one way it's going to do it is it's going to help us who are defending and it's going to be allow us to do things that we've never really done very well before like who wants to look at a 5000 row uh you know log to see if anybody tried to do anything awful on that particular computer right human beings are not that great at doing that kind of data analysis but an but an artificial intelligence that's been built to do that, we'll do a wonderful job at it. And so we'll be able to find clues that we're gonna get attacked faster and we'll be able to defend ourselves. Now, the flip side of that is, is that the cyber criminals are very well organized and they have all the same stuff that we have. So as we're learning how to use AI, unfortunately, they're learning how to use AI as well. And they're gonna try to do the same thing. They're gonna try to figure out ways to automate their attacks so that they can come at us in a faster and more furious way than ever before. And so, so just for our own uh, safety, we've got to figure out 
how to get these AI tools to work for our benefit because we, we can be sure that the people attacking us are going to do that. does look like we just got one more in here. Um, if we have time, have, give it to me. Yeah. At what age is appropriate to start talking about fraud, cybersecurity with your kids? You know, as long as you do it in an age appropriate way, it there's almost not, it's almost not too early. Um, anytime you would talk to your children about money. So whenever you think the right time is to, to, to talk about that with them, I would just add, you know, the fraud conversation right in there, right next to it. You know, because with even without internet fraud, let's face it, um, you know, there's been bullies stealing kids' milk money for generations, right? That's that's real world fraud. We just have to talk to them about online fraud as well and online bullies and that sort of thing. So, you know, what's going on on the internet, generally speaking, isn't new. What's new is that it's happening over the internet. But but the but what's actually causing it is people behaving badly. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think that wraps up the time we have. Um, if you get, do think of more questions, we are having a Q&A here shortly at 6.50. So feel free to bring your questions over there and we'd be more than happy to answer them. I like your bowl, Bradley. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool photo or no painting, I guess. Is it a painting? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah.